very warm good evening to our viewers. Welcome to the Evening Review Show. I'm your host, Matthias Alfico. Well, the African healthcare sector has made significant strides over the years to ensure that the healthcare is accessible for, ever, for all. And over the years, also, healthcare providers have been working on uh, innovative ways to ensure that uh, they are at least uh, advanced solutions to facilitate access to medical assistance remotely. Is a concept uh, called telemedicine. Um, to speak more about this, we have Mr. Rodney Taylor, Taylor in studio tonight, albeit virtually. He's the Managing Director of Guardian Eye. Mr. Taylor, good evening and welcome to the show. Uh, good evening and thank you for having me. Well, it's always it's a pleasure to have you here. Well, Mr. Taylor, the concept of telemedicine, um, viewers would probably be wondering, what, what is telemedicine all about? What is this? What concept is this? Um, if, if I'm used to walking to a clinic for, to see a, a doctor every day for healthcare, what would what is different about this telemedicine concept? Hundred percent, yes. So telemedicine is something that's been around for some time. Um, I mean, we can go as far as far back as the, one of the original early wars, where they actually used a telegram service to actually um, consult with doctors that got injured actually out in battle. So communicating um, with a patient, uh, with a doctor not actually physically being with the patient, has been around for some time. But there's always been the challenges, especially in Africa, with regards to the infrastructure and especially connectivity in, you know, on the African continent has not always been uh, as, 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 as we see, have got in the first world, America and Europe, you know, they have no connectivity issues. But with the cell phone boom that happened in, you know, across the African continent, that bridge is getting closed drastically that you can physically now have virtual consultations with a patient and with a, and, and with a doctor. So I think infrastructure and connectivity and mobile cell phones as well as the internet has played a big part in what's happening worldwide with healthcare. Yeah. One would wonder what type of consultations would this involve? Surely there must be certain uh, ailments which would still require me to go see a doctor physically. Yeah, definitely. So this is, this is not going to fix everything. You know, you still have your, your chronic uh, conditions out there. This is this is your primary health care. And this is, I mean, that's generally what you know, the African continent requires is it's to, to access primary health care and, and to get access to it, you know, efficiently and, and quickly. We often hear people waiting days before they can actually see a doctor. Yeah. And I mean, I must say, this is not an African problem. I mean, if you if you go to the UK at the moment, you can wake up, wait up to three weeks before you can actually see a primary healthcare doctor. So this is a global problem. Um, and you know, with us, you know, this is a product that's been designed and developed in South Africa, mm -hmm. um, but it's also been using our European partners. So this is a combination of both, of both first world um, partners as well as third world partners to create this one product that's available for everybody. Yeah. Um, well, um, this, uh, the Avahigo medical device, um... Has this been rolled out already on the continent? It most definitely has. So it's it's been rolled out in over twenty countries at the moment. It's been it's it's in its third year. But what 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 has changed is, and this is what happened in South Africa and also in many countries, is when COVID happened, our legislation had to adapt and had to change for the new world and you know and the new problems that we were facing because. In the past, well, this is in South Africa's legislation, mm -hmm. you were you were unable to see a doctor unless you had met with that doctor's nurse yeah. or if you had actually met with that doctor prior. Um, with, with the COVID epidemic, I mean, people couldn't get to see doctors, people couldn't get to see nurses, clinics were unavailable. So yeah. this is when our, our products started really rapidly growing at pace, where um, the customers were starting to download our mobile app and that connected to our digital equipment mm -hmm. um, can be housed anywhere. I mean, that equipment can be in a person's home, it can be in a school, it can be in a corporate, um, so as long as that, that, that device is connected to our app, we can do a physical diagnosis of that patient and not having to have a, a doctor in the room or even have a nurse in the room. The actual equipment does it for us. Yeah. Um, someone, someone might even ask that, but how is it possible that through this device and how reliable is it for someone to make an informed diagnosis from a distance? Yes, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable how, how fast this has grown. I mean, you know, adoption is always is always the first you know it's, it's always when when new technology comes out it's always about you know will the people adopt it mm -hmm. reminds me when uber first came out and when AMB, airbnb first came out it took a while for the adoption process to happen and then and then it virtually exploded 
Yeah. And that's what we're finding is happening with Ava at the moment because we are saying, and also that we've got three areas that we're focusing on. One, it needs to be reliable. I mean, you, you asked the correct question there. And our doctors, our European doctors, as well as our South African doctors, are all standing behind the product. We've, we've identified that the diagnosis is as accurate as if the person was sitting in the room with, with the doctor. We've got a, um, a, an accuracy of diagnosis of, of over 97%. And if the doctor can't give a physical diagnosis of the data that he's receiving, he then won't give that diagnosis. He will then say, look, it's best that you come in, uh, come and see me or, or go into your nearest clinic. So but no doctor will ever give a diagnosis unless they're 100% certain of what they're going to be diagnosing. Yeah. Um, you, you said it's been rolled out for about three years now. Um, what are some of, 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 of the issues that has been picked up in terms of challenges, perhaps, as far as the rollout is concerned? Has there been any? So the, 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 the first challenge we faced was a lot of companies um, have got very strict um, internet policies, you know, with, with cyber security and the cyber threats that we face at the moment, whereby we were using um, companies' physical connectivity. That, that was one of our challenges or a hurdle that we had to get over. So what we've designed is the product actually connects to a private network, which is managed by Guardian Eye. So one, it prevents any firewall or port problems that, that we can't get access to the equipment or access to the doctor, mm -hmm. as well as the cyber threat. And, and there's, a, there's a lot of you know, um, privacy uh, acts when it comes to medical information. So we, we also house information in, in certain instances that needs to be in that country. So for instance, in South Africa, the, the medical data needs to be based in South Africa, it can't be housed in America. So every country that we're that, that we consulting and talking to has got different uh, legislation around yeah. you know how that data needs to be housed and where it needs to be housed so that possibly was our was was our biggest biggest hurdle and then i i guess the the, the second hurdle was just people starting to trust the technology you know yeah. once they've used it once or twice they see that it's it's the same as if they were sitting in front of a doctor mm -hmm. in person okay. yeah so how, how do you see this how do you see this uh sort of uh, new medical concept how do you see it transforming the African healthcare system going forward? So, so I see it as a, as a, as a product that complements you know, the healthcare industry. When, when once again, if you look, look at Uber, Uber didn't replace the public transport system. Uber didn't replace, you know, the, the, the taxi service systems. Yeah. It complemented an industry that was in, you know, that, that required a third option. We are saying AV is the third option in, in, in Africa. So yeah. if I refer to South Africa, you know, in South Africa, we've got our private healthcare um, facilities, which is often aimed at a certain vertical um, customer. Somebody can actually afford it. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, private healthcare is very expensive and it's, and it's a worldwide problem. So you've got private healthcare practitioners. Then you've got what we, we've got our, our national um, health, which most countries have offer some form of government health services. Mm -hmm. Same as in South Africa, but mm -hmm. those government services are, are heavily under pressure at the moment. You know, there's there's not enough access to, to to medical practitioners to the size of their actual populations, and also it's not very easy to, to you know access some of these access some of these sites. Yep. So what Ava complements the two because mm -hmm. one we're offering primary health at a radically low price. It's three US dollars per month. So you have full access to all of our medical practitioners, which is, and it's unlimited, and it's 24-7. Mm -hmm. And the physical doctors that we're hiring are coming out of the private sector or they're coming out of the government um, the services sector. So you've got a combination of private healthcare doctors, government healthcare doctors working together in a, con in a controlled environment uh, within Guardian and I, and then at a very, very reduced rate of $3 per month. And you're able to access us anywhere in, in, in the country. You can get to, uh, to a cell phone and download our app. You're able to get to our medical doctors. Yeah. Um, so what are, what are perhaps some of the legislative challenges that, uh, that, that you faced um, since rolling out this product? So, so as, as I mentioned earlier, every country has got its own legislation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're busy and we're about uh, talking to um, the guys in Mexico City at the moment. And, and there the legislation is obviously a lot different. So the biggest, I would say our biggest hurdle is it takes a couple of months for our team to understand the legislation in that country and for our team to build and design the product that, that enables us to work hand in hand with that legislation in, in that country. So every country is different, 
But at the end of the day, you know, every country is one, they're wanting to protect their own doctors, which is understandable. So in most countries, we will use those doctors in country. Um, two, obviously the data needs to be housed in a safe environment with, with, within that country. And three, the, you know, the mobile application also has to be compliant with, you know, with all of the stores, which, which was also quite a big hurdle when, when dealing with Apple. You know, Apple and iOS was quite a big hurdle when, when you started to put a new medical app into the store. But I think we've overcome all of those challenges now. And, and every time we pick a country, we, we've got a game plan to get that app in that country as fast as possible and complying with what government is requiring from us in that country. Mm -hmm. um, I know I know you mentioned earlier on about uh, the Internet situation on the continent as, as far as uh, coverage is concerned. Um, and especially the rural areas are normally um, if not cut off, they, they, they are normally subjected to poor connection that is. Um, what are you, you and your team doing to ensure that you also reach those in the remotest of areas? So, so from, a, from, a, from a device perspective, I mean, the, the, the device has got technology to compress the data. So it's generally below, below 40 megs mm -hmm. um, with regards to... Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, it's, it's the size of the file is 40 megs, mm -hmm. so we've been, we're, able to we're able to compress the consultation so it uses very little data. And, and we all know about what's happening with Elon Musk coming to the African continent. So that satellite technology that he's going to be deploying across Africa uh, will, will, be, will be brilliant for our product because then we'll be able to connect up a, that app anywhere on, on the African continent, no matter where you are. So we've got big hopes that that rolls out, but, but the coverage in... Africa, you still the coverage is still pretty good from the from the mobile networks, the SIM provide uh, networks. So well, there's not many areas that we haven't that we that we don't have covered at this point in time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Taylor, we wait for a short break, and we'll be back for the second half of the show. So stay tuned. Great, thank you. Thank you. Welcome back from the short break. Uh, Mr. Taylor, um, just to continue our conversation, um, would you say as a continent we've, we've uh, harnessed the benefits of technology enough to ensure access to healthcare for our people? I think, I, I think we haven't even scraped the surface yet. I think, um, you know, with, with products like Ava, and I mean, there, there, there's a lot more advancement happening, especially in AI around, you know, around medical healthcare. I see AI playing a very big role in you know especially in the african continent but it's evolving constantly and it, it's just it's up to those countries digital legislation to embrace this yeah. you know but at the same time and I, um, I look what's happening in south africa you know we are we are not saying that technology is here to replace your practitioners okay we are saying that we need that we need the medical practitioners the technology and the, and the physical medical practitioners need to work hand in hand for this to be a success it doesn't work, you know, the technology won't work without the actual human being behind it. So this is definitely not to replace, this is, this is to complement the two technologies. And what we've seen in South Africa, I mean, we've, we've, we've got some of the worst um, unemployment rates on the African continent, is with this type of medical technology and with our legislation changing, it allows us to train up people that are, that are non-medical. So you don't require a nurse to actually use our equipment. So we, we've got an academy, we've got young, young up and coming um, 
people that are coming out of schools and they've got you know there's no they've got no work mm -hmm. we are taking that group of individuals and starting to train them that they can physically use our medical equipment that then will then be connected to our doctors and those doctors then will make the diagnosis we've also got a brain drain you know a, a, a brain drain of doctors that are wanting to leave this south africa and, and it's the same across the entire continent that, that they seem to think the grass is greener across across the ocean but mm -hmm. With AVA and with products and technology like this, you can retain your doctors in your country, you can retain your IP, and those doctors then can work in country using technology and not be leaving our shores. Yeah. Well, but if I'm a GP sitting at home, um, why, why would I not believe that uh, this remote GP consultations uh, will take away my job? <laughs> well, it's it's... It's it's definitely going to disrupt. I mean, I'm not, I'm not. It, it, it is definitely going to disrupt, but it, it's not going to take away their jobs. It's going to allow them to work in a different environment. It's not. It's the the old traditional way of having brick and mortar, very similar to what's happened with online shopping. You still have your shops and your stores. Certain people will still go and shop, and um, but look, I think 25 percent of transactions now are happening yeah. online when it comes to shop shopping in the African continent. And I see that starting to grow when it comes to medical primary health care. It will start growing and growing. It's never going to replace that, that doctor sitting you know, in, in his doctor's practice, but it's most definitely going to increase. And this allows us to get to more patients at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, well, this sort of online-based healthcare uh, system that, that we are moving towards to, um, not just on the continent, um, world over, um, what, what sort of legislation... Um, do, do you foresee should be in place to, to protect not only the doctors, but also patients who would be making use of these uh, upcoming technologies? Well, you, you're 100%. So, I mean, the legislation that's, that, that, that South Africa has put in place has been pretty sound. I mean, it, it, it protects both the patients. So an example, when, when you're using this technology, us as the company that's created the technology, we can't see the patient's information or patient's diagnosis. So that relationship remains between the patient and the doctor. And I think that's that's that that's solid foundation. And I mean that's that's extremely critical that that that, that remains in place because we have companies now that are starting to use our product. And you know, those companies uh, they're providing it as a benefit for their employees. And I've always said that an employer and an employee relationship has always been intact, that that private information relating to that employee's health. Is, is always you know is always protected and is and is, is not compromised. So I think that's that's a big thing that legislation must was what must stick to. And the second thing is is from a price perspective, uh, and, and I think that's what a lot a lot of the national health um, programs all about. Yeah. It's to get the pricing down that, that anybody can have access to primary health care. So I think that's a big thing. It doesn't help to launch this amazing technology and then it's only priced for the elite. So, so, so we've got our three A's. You know, this must be for anybody. It must be for anywhere, and at at any time, you must be able to have access to a doctor. So, with our technology, we are saying within forty minutes, if you've got our technology on your phone, within forty minutes you could have had an appointment, uh, been been digitally diagnosed by our equipment, been then physically diagnosed by a telephone call like we're having now with a doctor, yeah. and have a script or a sick note dispatched to your cell phone within forty minutes. And that's what we're trying to aim for, is to, get, is to get people to see practitioners a lot faster to prevent um, any outbreaks. Yeah. Um, of course, we do know that uh, the security aspect is always a very big concern um, when it comes to uh, engagements of this nature. Um, it's, it's more like uh, 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 someone saying, you, you, you want me to share my credit card uh, uh, password or, uh, on a site that's not secure and so on. Maybe just, just for the benefit and for the ease of, of those who, who would want to, to, to venture into this sort of a telemedicine area, w what are the security measures in place? I know you mentioned here the issue of uh, the safety of patients' info and so on. What are some of yes. those things that you have in place to ensure that um, my diagnosis will not end up uh, on... Uh, 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 making rounds on Twitter or X for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> no, very valid point. I mean, and that's what I'm saying, that people need to trust the technology, but also people need to trust the company they're dealing with. I guess that's a big thing. Um, so, you know, all that I can say is in, if, if a consumer or a company is looking to use this type of technology, just make sure that the company that they're dealing with one is reputable and also make sure that that company is, is, is complied with all the, all the digital certificates that's required. So, you get your ISO uh, 9001, you get your ISO 27001, 
So those are two very critical um, uh, digital uh, compliance or certificates that are required. And, and, and that, uh, I'm almost saying countries should insist, and most countries are insisting that those kind of digital cyber um, practices are in, are in place. So it's, it's, a way, it's a way how we manage that data and make sure it's secure, make sure it doesn't sit in one place, make sure it's in country, yeah, and, and, and most definitely, you know, you, you could be, that data can't be compromised. It's, and the second part that we do is health data, we keep for life. So as part of our policies, your, your data is stored with us for life. So you might have been diagnosed 10 years ago by us. That diagnosis will still be there for another doctor to go, to go back and, and, and refer to, which is also something which is new to the, the African continent because a lot of things these days are still done by paper. You know, filed away in a, in a filing cabinet in, in, in somebody's office where this digital record now is with you for life. Any, you, you, you've constantly got it with you in your, in your hand, which is also which is quite unique for, for the African continent. Yeah. Um, so this sort of uh, uh, parallel health systems that we are moving to online and on the ground, um, w what needs to happen to ensure that in terms of the quality of healthcare that that is not uh, compromised? Uh, working very closely with the, you know, with the, with, the, with the various health departments in, in each country. So, I mean, you know, in South Africa, I mean, the, the medical uh, compliance is very high. I mean, South Africa and many African countries have got extremely high quality healthcare. They just don't have accessibility. They're just not, there's just not enough doctors and just not enough locations. And it's too costly for the, for the, for the general pay, public to access, you know, to access those facilities. So, yeah, it's, it's, it, it needs to be compliant. I mean, even our equipment has gone through vigorous testing by the international uh, accreditation associations like TUV. And in South Africa, there's an accreditation like SAPRA. In America, there's an accreditation like the FDA. So, you know, the, 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 the company or the technology partner that's supplying this makes, needs to make sure that they comply with all of that to ensure that the healthcare that you're delivering is 100% safe and 100% compliant. Yeah. So, so how are the numbers looking since the rollout, um, whether it's from a patient perspective or from from the doctors themselves? No, no it's been it's been it's been extremely good. It, the and it's, I always say it's like a, it's like lighting a felt fire. Mm -hmm. You know, as soon as that fire starts going, you know, it's it's, it's very hard to stop. So, in our initial trials in South Africa, we we our trials are based across five thousand patients. Mm -hmm. Highly successful. We had a, we had a one hundred percent accuracy in, in diagnosis, and something that also we picked up during those those five thousand patients is the companies that were using us. They picked up a trend that their staff were, were sick days were being reduced, and the, the reason for that is quite simple. One, because obviously it's affordable, and also you know the, the access is easy because it's twenty four seven. Mm -hmm. And and the third the third part was that. We are picking up symptoms early on. An example, if somebody we picked up an ear infection, we would pick up early in the, in, in the process that that ear infection could be rectified very early in, in the stage, whereas in the past, that person may not have got into that healthcare as fast, uh, which, which subsequently then would have them off sick for even a longer period of time. So it's, it's, a, it's a proactive approach to healthcare, not a reactive, where most times out there people are reactive when they're ill, and we all know what it's like. We try and self-diagnose. Uh, we wait a couple of days, and then we end up going to the doctor. So this is this is to prevent that type of um, thing happening again. Yeah. Um, w w when you, you spoke of the cost, I think you, you mentioned about is it three US dollars per month, and and, and I'm just yes. and I'm just thinking um, about uh, the fight of uh, between digital currencies and, and and the conventional banking system. Um, how would that be managed from a legislative perspective, especially when uh, thinking of, uh, of of medical aid providers, service providers? So currently, yeah. So well, I just gave a price of three dollars because I mean the dollar is, is a recognised you know, yeah. um, um, currency worldwide. But in each country, we we charge in that country's um, currency. So in South Africa, it would be it would be rands. And yeah, it would be it would be fifty nine rand ninety, which reverts back to your you know your three dollar mark at the yeah. moment. So we try to we try to keep this at, at, at a three dollar mark, depending on what currency is in country. As I say, this we really wanting this to be affordable and, and access to everybody. Yeah. Well, Mr. Taylor, thank you very much for your time this evening, and we we thank you for your brief.
Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thanks for allowing me to join your show. And uh, hopefully your viewers have, have learned a little bit more about where telemedicine, asynchronous digital uh, healthcare is going in, in, in the African continent. Yeah, thank you very much. And all the best with your work. Thank you. Well, to our thank viewers, you. Good evening. from the Evening Review team. Thank you very much for staying tuned. See you again tomorrow, same time, same place. Thank <laughs> you.